what I did get to see was the AEW All Out show last night, which I thought was excellent. Uh, it was a long show, too long, ran just shy of midnight, which is why I couldn't do a live stream because I had to wake up to do the uh, TV stuff in the morning. So my hope is that their future shows are shorter. I understand that they still haven't gotten television, so all of these shows up to this point, Double or Nothing, Fighter Fest, Fight for the Fallen, to a large extent, they've had to use these shows to condense a lot of different personalities, a lot of different tag teams, a lot of different people in, to give them exposure and to get people familiar with who they are. Once they get television, my hope is that these events, which they're not doing every month, hallelujah, they're not having monthly pay-per-views, even still, I don't see the need for these shows to go four hours. So hopefully they'll be shorter going forward. Uh, but I thought this was an excellent show. Twitter poll results so far. The poll is still open, by the way. Uh, at Solomonster is my handle if you want to go back and vote. It's not too late. So far, over 3,100 votes, 83% thumbs up, just 17% thumbs down, and overwhelmingly positive response to this show. The buy-in pre-show opened with the 21-woman casino battle royal. The women enter in blocks with one Joker pick at the very end. That's the final entrant. First five entries were Leva Bates, Apache, Priscilla Kelly. For those wondering, yes, that's the uh, tampon girl. Shalandra Royal and Nyla Rose. Up next, they had Penelope Ford, Shaz and McKenzie, Sadie Gibbs. Sadie Gibbs is really good. Uh, Big Swole and Britt Baker. And Nyla Rose played the role of just the dominant force here in this, even more than Awesome Kong when she came in. Nyla Rose was in from the very beginning. Obviously, she was there at the very end. And she played the role of uh, the dominant ass kicker, the uh, so-called force to be reckoned with here in this match. I guess that's going to be uh, her role uh, going forward. Next out, they had Tennille Dashwood, who just signed with Impact. So it looks like there may be a working relationship, maybe, possibly, between the two companies. There's at least an understanding, uh, smartly, from the Impact side. They have no buzz. They have just nothing going on in terms of people talking about them. They could have the best wrestling on the planet. It doesn't matter. Nobody knows about it. Nobody can watch it. Nobody's paying attention. If I didn't even mention the fact just now that, you know, Tennille Dashwood signed with Impact... You know, how many of you who don't follow along with all the news sites and newsletters and stuff would have had any idea? <laughs> Probably not very many of you. So I look at it as nothing but a positive. You know, they want their talent to, uh, you know, show up on some of these shows. I don't recall if the announcers made mention of the fact that she's from Impact Wrestling. That's something I would probably insist on. If, you know, if I'm someone from the Impact side, I don't know if they did that last night. Uh, and, and who knows, maybe it's a one-off. But I think it would be in their best interest to try to form some kind of working relationship with AEW, which is the hot hand right now at the moment and is going to have a lot more exposure than Impact does on TNT once they go to television in about a month. So she was out there, Ivelisse, Bea Priestley, Brandy Rhodes, and Awesome Kong. Britt Baker jumped Priestley in the aisle. Priestley is the one who concussed her in that match. They had it fight for the fall in the tag match. We got a Nyla Rose, Awesome Kong exchange. Brandy had an exchange with Nyla Rose. I, You know, I thought that in this exchange here, Brandy Rhodes looked good. She looked good in there for the limited stuff that she did, better than she looked at uh, last time. Was it Fight for the Fallen against Allie? Speaking of which, out next was Allie, Nicole Savoy, Teal Piper, ODB with her trademark flask in hand, and Jazz. Haven't seen Jazz in a long time. She's now sporting a shaved head. Britt Baker eliminated Awesome Kong. Brandy got dumped out, although I didn't see by who. Uh, the Joker entrant, final entrant in the Battle Royal, was Mercedes Martinez, who got a great reaction. She got a superstar reaction coming out. I, I hope they've signed her, because if not, after that reaction, I don't know why they wouldn't. You know, WWE had their chance. She was in the Mae Young Classic. She had a few matches in NXT. and I th Actually, I think she might have been in both Mae Young Classics. And they didn't sign her. Or maybe they offered her something and for whatever reason she didn't accept. Who knows? Their loss. Their loss, I think, could be AEW's gain. 
But she, she look, she's been doing this for a long time. Uh, I know she's probably older than a lot of the women that were in this match. Although, you know, I don't know how old Jazz is in Awesome Kong. Uh, but she's not a rookie. I get that. But she's a great wrestler. And obviously she has a following. And if I'm AEW, I want to tap into that. Final four in the ring were Mercedes Martinez, Nyla Rose, Bea Priestley, and Britt Baker. Uh, Martinez was eliminated. People weren't overly happy about that. We got to see Britt Baker hit a Canadian Destroyer on Bea Priestley and then eliminate her. Priestley reached up, right? So she's already been eliminated, but she's a poor sport. Tell me if this doesn't remind you of somebody. So instead of leaving, she reaches up and she grabs a hold of Baker, I think her, her arm. And that allowed Nyla Rose to dump Britt Baker out of the ring. I can't believe it. They went with the 92 Rumble finish with Hogan and Sid. The only difference is Hogan at the time was a babyface who acted like a total bitch. <laughs> at least here, Bri Bea Priestley, she's a heel. And she's got beef with you know, Britt Baker. And of course, it's natural that she would want to cost her the match. But in 92, Hogan it was just a bad look for Hogan. People were happy when Hogan got dumped out of the ring. That's not what they would want you to believe. <laughs> and they dubbed over the footage a few weeks later. But yeah, they went with the 92 Rumble finish here. And now, now, this was not nearly as good. Not even close. But at least points for try. So Nyla Rose will now challenge to become the first ever AEW Women's Champion on the TNT debut show on October 2nd. Uh, I had Britt Baker winning. She was my pick, so I was this close, but close doesn't count. There was some sloppiness in here. Uh, but you know what? As battle royals go when this thing was over, I thought it was entertaining. I didn't think it was a terrible battle royal. I didn't think it was a great battle royal. It was a good battle royal. That That's my overall impression of this, of this match. Because there have been some bad battle royals. And there have been some matches on some of these AEW pre-shows that I'm not a huge fan of. This, I didn't think this was bad. The other thing also is no Kylie Ray. Now, you go back to Double or Nothing and some of those early, uh, well, I mean, I guess that would be the earliest of the uh, AEW shows. Kylie Ray was a featured performer. She was the one who came out. She kind of had the Bailey gimmick where she's all happy-go-lucky and she, you know, got a big reaction from the crowd. And she's been an independent wrestler for a while, and she has just disappeared off the face of the earth. She has been MIA now for months, supposedly dealing with some kind of a personal matter. Nobody seems to know what that is because it's personal. Tony Khan was asked about her in the post-show media scrum when the event was over. And he said that not only was she not in the Battle Royal on the show, but she had asked for and has been granted her release from AEW. He said it was totally amicable, but she came to them and asked to be released, and they said okay, and they granted her release. I have no idea what's going on. I hope everything is okay. We then had House of Glory's own private party, Mark Ken and Isaiah Cassidy taking on Jack Evans and Angelico. Private party, big time fan favorites here. Very cool to see them get that kind of reaction in what is really only their second appearance, I think, officially. I think they were in the crowd maybe at the last show, but this was really only their second time in the ring at an AEW event. And this was their coming out party in AEW. This was the biggest match of their career up to this point, save possibly for the match they just had a few weeks ago against the Young Bucks at the HOG show. But this was the biggest win of their career. They hit double poison ranas towards the end, followed by their gin and juice finish and private party picked up the win uh, in what I thought overall was a pretty good match. Uh, I figured they would get the win here because they're wrestling the Bucks October 9th, that second week of AEW on TNT, in the tag team title tournament. So, you know, it just stands to reason that you would want them to have at least one big win heading into that match against the Bucks. Uh, but that really, the finish itself here to this match was a hell of a finish. Evans and Angelico, they raised their arms when the match was over. And then they ambushed them. And the crowd chanted, party poopers. Uh, best way to describe this match, this was a sprint. But that's exactly what it should have been. This was the match that this crowd was looking for. They got the match that they wanted. 
Now, before we get into the pay-per-view here, I just want to mention they had Excalibur and Golden Boy doing the commentary for the pre-show. I thought they did a fine job. I enjoyed them. They didn't uh, piss me off. They didn't do anything to insult my intelligence. So all the different things that I've become accustomed to the announcers doing <laughs> in wrestling, uh, I thought they were fine together. And I said, you know, Golden Boy last week, I said, is a good pickup for them. I thought he did a good job on that Fighter Fest show. He brings, you know, kind of a, a youthful, different voice to the broadcast. He's a fan, obviously. He knows what he's doing. He's got, you know, announcing experience. He doesn't sound awkward. And I thought the two of them gelled well. Then they brought Jim Ross in. And I thought Jim Ross was much improved from the last time that we saw him. He was, you know, making some mistakes. And he can come off sometimes like he he's in a bad mood or he's uh, he doesn't want to be there. I don't want to say that that's the case. That's that's unfair. I'm just saying that's how he comes across sometimes. I didn't get that sense last night. He seemed to gel better with Excalibur. He gelled fine, I thought, with Golden Boy. Uh, the X Factor here was Alex Marvez, who they took out of the booth, which was a good move on their part, and instead it was him and Excalibur hosting the post-show on YouTube when the show was over. I think that was a much better place for him to be. And I thought overall the commentary, it wasn't perfect, but I thought overall it was a big improvement from last time. So now we get to the actual pay-per-view. We had a boy and his dinosaur, calling them the Jurassic Express. And Marco Stunt, that's Marco Stunt, Jungle Boy, and Luchasaurus opening the pay-per-view against SCU, Daniels, Kazarian, and Scorpio Sky. Massive pop for really all three of the uh, Jurassic Express, but in particular, Luchasaurus. Massive pop for the Luchasaurus, especially after Marco Stunny hit this Tope Suicida through Jungle Boy's legs out to the floor. And then Jungle Boy hit, I think it was a moonsault that he hit. So now Luchasaurus is in the ring, and he's like, man, I feel left out. You know what? I'm going to join in the party here. And this big SOB hits a dive of his own, like a cannonball dive out over the top rope, Wipes everybody out. Place comes unglued. This guy, he I can't begin to tell you how over this guy was in this building last night. Finish came after Kazarian gave Luchasaurus a head scissors on the outside, and that sent him into his own partners. He wiped out Jungle Boy. He wiped out Marco Stunt. Inside, they give a spike tombstone to Jungle Boy and Marco Stunt, both, for the win. SCU picks up the win. SCU then shows respect to the baby faces, shakes their hands. Unlike the last match, where we saw Jack Evans and Angelico attack Private Party, uh, there was no ambush here. That was different. I thought that was very unique. That the heel, and clearly SCU, I mean, they're positioned as, at least in this match, they were positioned as the heels. You would not have expected that from them when the match was over. I thought it was a, a nice, pleasant surprise that they didn't just attack them. It's kind of, all right, they're going to attack them. Of course they are. And then they didn't. So I thought that was uh, kind of unique. I thought this was a, a hot opener, fun way to open the show. You got a man in a dinosaur mask who has the potential to be the biggest breakout star in all of wrestling. I'll be the first to say it's a pretty badass looking mask. I said that when he was in Lucha Underground. So it helps to have a cool looking mask, but he's still a guy in a dinosaur mask. But this guy has Superstar written all over him. And I have to say this. I did say that the announcing was fine and Jim Ross and everything was, was much improved from last time. Jim Ross needs to stop calling Jungle Boy Jungle Jack. I understand Jack is his real name. Jack Perry. I get that. His name is not Jungle Jack. His name is not Jungle Jim. His name is Jungle Boy. It's the Jungle Jack over and over again. It was getting on my nerves. Kenny Omega against the Bastard, Pac. And yes, I am calling him Pac, like I did last week, because the announcers were calling him Pac here, because that's his name. I think Jim Ross called him Pac. His name is Pac. That's how they pronounce it. That's how I pronounce it. I had a few people, oh, it's, pa it's Pac, Solomon. Sir. No, it's not. It's Pac. So that's what I'm calling him. AEW took a negative in John Moxley's injury, his staph infection. They turned it into a positive. They replaced him with Pac. And this turned out to be the match that I was most looking forward to going into this show. And I thought these two delivered. I thought they had a hell of a match. 
Not a blowaway match, not a match of the year or anything like that, but an excellent match all the same, with what I thought was a shocking finish. It was shocking to me anyway. I could not have pre- I did not predict that. I did not see that coming. Pack landed a moonsault onto Omega on the floor. He smacked his shin on top of the metal guardrail. They uh, did not leave a whole lot of room on this show between the ring and these guardrails. And there were a few times during this match alone where these guys almost killed themselves on those guardrails. Thankfully, Pack had a, a thick shin pad on. Otherwise, I don't doubt for a second that he would have shattered his leg. Back inside, 450 by Pack, near fall. Omega goes for the one-winged angel. He tried that two or three different times here in this match. Couldn't hit it. On his last attempt, Pack countered the one-winged angel attempt into his brutalizer submission. It was almost like a uh, crucifix. And looked pretty painful. You could see Omega fading and fading and fading. And finally, he passed out. Blacked out. Referee called the match off. And by submission, Pack wins. I did not see that coming. And what it does is it vaults Pack into contention, maybe not right away, but it vaults him into contention for the AEW title. It sets up a comeback story now for Omega. Omega's got to fight his way back. He lost to Jericho, a double or nothing. He did win against Shima at the last show, but now he suffers another big loss. And both losses were fair and square. You know, he lost to Jericho fair and square. He lost to Pack fair and square. No shenanigans, no interference, no nonsense, no weapons, no bullshit. So he now has to, you know, he has to come back. He has to fight his way back. I don't mind it at all. And it means Pack is signed for more than just one match. There were some questions still whether or not this was a one shot. Did they call on him, you know, just to come in to replace Moxley or what was the deal with him? pretty obvious now that he signed I don't know if he signed long term but obviously he signed for more than just one match which is great we then had a cracker barrel clash Darby Allen Jimmy Havoc and Joey Janela every bit as crazy as you would expect Jimmy Havoc used a staple gun on himself at the start of the match I mean that says it all right there then they got Havoc outside the ring they tied him down to a chair They poured thumbtacks in his mouth, and they duct-taped his mouth shut. Janela hit an emerald frozen to Darby Allin on the ring apron. Havoc broke free, grabbed a piece of paper. He started giving Janela paper cuts with it. You know what? That spot works for me. And I understand, again, it's maybe one of those things that some people will look at it and go, Oh, it exposes the business. Oh, what are these guys doing? Jim Cornette, he's going to pitch a fit. Jim Cornette gives a shit. I I get that, but if you've ever had a paper cut before, that shit sucks, okay? Paper cuts suck. That shit hurts. Never doubt the pain of a paper cut. When he shredded that paper across his mouth, I winced. So it worked on me. Janela hit a running sunset flip off the apron on Darby Allen, put him through a table on the floor. Janela then did a dive on the opposite side of the ring out to the floor on nobody at all. Nobody was there. I couldn't, I don't know, if maybe Havoc moved out of the way. I have to think Jimmy Havoc was there and he moved. (laughs) I couldn't see it though. It just looked like he decided to dive for the sake of diving. And he hit the metal ramp. They had an actual cracker barrel. Actually, he had two of them. They had one cracker barrel at the top of the ramp. They had one cracker barrel at the bottom of the ramp. And those came into play. They had a plate of biscuits or cornbread. Was it cornbread? I'm I'm st- I'm sorry. I'm still thinking of the brisket and the pulled pork at the uh, NBC this morning. <laughs> I still got that on my brain. Now now you throw in biscuits and cornbread, you got a full meal. When's Thanksgiving? I can't wait. So they had this plate of of food, whatever it was. It was making me hungry. He smashed it in Janella's face. Janella, by the way, at one point he was searching for toys under the ring to play with. And he pulled out a tennis racket. And then he kind of looked at it, and he's like, Ugh, and he chucked it aside. Like, who would ever use a tennis racket as a weapon? That is his now regular shot at Jim Cornette. He, you know, a lot of these guys will say, oh, you know, Cornette, he's a wrestler. And I'm not, look, I'm not giving my opinion one way or the other. Cornette is a very polarizing figure. Every time there's some new controversy, I don't get involved. Because honestly, to be perfectly honest with you, 
I don't give a shit. I am not so moved to care enough to comment on any of this stuff. But I will say this, you have these wrestlers who say he's a wrestling relic. He shouldn't be taken seriously. Let's not give him any oxygen or the time of day. He's yesterday's news. And yet, they can't stop talking about this guy. They can't stop referring to him. Fascinating how that works. Darby Allen introduced a skateboard, the back of which was littered in thumbtacks. So that was different. Darby Allen, who seems to have a death wish, he grabbed one of the barrels, takes the barrel up to the top rope with him. He positions the barrel behind him. Now, before this, he had laid Jimmy Havoc across the ring steps. So you got to picture this. Jimmy Havoc is laying across the ring steps. Darby Allen climbs up top. He's got this barrel. He places the barrel behind him. He does a truss dive backwards. Havoc moves. And the barrel explodes on impact. And the impact on those steps did not look very fun for Darby Allen. In fact, they zoomed in on his back when he was laying there. And his back was all purple, black and blue. But this guy has a death wish. You look at the coffin drop and all the stuff this guy puts his body through. You would think he enjoys it. I think it was Golden Boy who said on commentary this match was making him physically uncomfortable. Not as much as these th- these three guys, I'm sure. Havoc superplexed Janela off the top rope for what looked like it was supposed to be the finish, with Janela crashing through the other barrel that they brought into the ring, but only his foot caught the barrel, and so Havoc hit a lariat, and in doing so, he knocked Janela down through the barrel, finally pinned him. I don't know what to say about this, other than these men are insane. And it was exactly the kind of match this crowd wanted to see. And they gave them what they wanted. I did not expect Jimmy Havoc to walk away with the win. I had predicted Janela. And if I had to pick a number two choice, it would have been Darby Allin. And, you know, Havoc would have been at the bottom of the list. But there you go. Jimmy Havoc picks up the win. I guess he's got to win at some point, right? You got to throw Jimmy Havoc a bone every now and then. Maybe this was their way of just throwing him a win. But this uh, this match was pretty crazy. Not a huge fan of all the hardcore stuff, but this was uh, entertaining for what it was supposed to be. Then we have the Dark Order against the best friends, Chucky T and Trent Barretta. Winner gets a bye in the AEW Tag Team Title Tournament. I said going in, the whole bye thing, the whole concept of getting a bye into the next round, it would make sense for the heel team to win the match and get the bye, and that's exactly what happened. I cannot look at Evil Uno in that outfit that he wears without thinking of one of those uh, hostile movies, and it just makes me sick. (laughs) It just makes me sick. I mean, you think back to, like, the oddities and the Attitude Era, I guess in a way, Golga had a similar... Well, the mask, at least. The mask was similar. I mean, Golga, at least, he looked semi-normal. He had had the Eric Cartman doll that he carried with him everywhere. He wore a T-shirt and, I think, sweatpants. That wasn't as bad... I just, I look at this evil Uno guy and he just creeps me the fuck out. I mean, maybe that's the point. I don't know. But he creeps me out, but in a bad way. Like, I don't want to watch this guy. Dark Order won with the fatality to get the bye. Weakest match on the main card up to this point. My problem with the Dark Order, they're actually very good wrestlers. It's not just a gimmick. They can wrestle. They can work. Absolutely. But there's absolutely nothing menacing about them whatsoever. They're supposed to be this dark team. You're supposed to be afraid of them. They're evil. They're this, they're that. There is not a single thing about these guys that screams menacing or scary whatsoever. That gimmick does not work. They would be better served to ditch it and just start over again. I keep hearing Super Smash Brothers. Oh, Solomonster, I can't believe you've never heard of the Super Smash Brothers in in, the other promotions they were in previously. No, I haven't. I keep hearing all these wonderful things about the Super Smash Brothers. I haven't seen it so far. They can wrestle, but this gimmick sucks. I am not impressed by what I have seen. And for the people who did know of their work before this, who praise it and say, oh, well, you know what, then I guess AEW is is not doing right by these guys. Because it didn't seem like the crowd was much into it either. It didn't seem like I was the only one not into this. They were carrying Beretta's carcass to the back when the lights went out. When they came back on in the ring was Orange Cassidy. 
Standing in the ring with his hands in his pockets, he did a uh, tope through the ropes. One of about 24 that we saw on this show. In fact, Jim Ross, the lead play-by-play announcer for this promotion, I think it was during the main event, or one of the main events, actually made a comment. He didn't make the comment to himself off camera <laughs> on his podcast. He just blurted out, you know, how many of these tope suicidas we've had on this show. And he's not wrong, but I don't know that that's the sort of thing you want to point out while the show is in progress. Orange Cassidy left with the best friends. In fact, the best friends did a group hug in the ring with Cassidy in the middle. And then they all left together, so it looks like he may be one of the best friends now. I guess he's the uh, the lazy friend. He's the friend who uh, doesn't want to get a job, but he just wants to sit at home and mooch off his roommate. We had Riho, all 98 pounds of her, against Hikara Shida, with the winner meeting Nyla Rose on October 2nd on TNT to crown the first ever AEW Women's Champion. Shida worked over Riho's back, bent her in half, put her in a, a deep Boston Crab Riho battled back, landed a double foot stomp off the top rope onto Sheeta on the apron. She may only be 98 pounds, but that still probably doesn't feel too good. Riho picks up the win with a head scissors into a pin on Sheeta. Not my favorite match on the card. Uh, it was a good match, not overly exciting, uh, but you know, well worked. It was fine for what it was, but by no means my favorite match. It does create... An interesting dynamic now for that championship match October 2nd. You're going to have Riho in there, who's very small and very light, against the much larger Nyla Rose. I'm, I have to think that Nyla Rose is walking away the first ever women's champion in AEW. I would be kind of shocked if she didn't at this point. We then had Cody and Sean Spears in a grudge match. Say what you want about Cody. I know he's turned into, at least on social media, it seems like he's turned into this very polarizing figure. Some people like the guy. Some people absolutely hate his guts. You get a lot of divided opinion about Cody. He has his fans. He has his detractors. I will say that Cody has been involved in some really great matches that have gotten a ton of heat. And this was no different. In fact, this was my favorite match of the night. Even more than the latter match. And probably a little bit more even than Omega and Pac. Cody, Brandy, DDP, MJF all came out wearing Star Wars themed outfits. We had uh, MJF out there with his scarf over his uh, Star Trek attire. Brandy, Cody came out first. Brandy came out separately with DDP, MJF, and Cody and Brandy's dog, Pharaoh. Pharaoh the dog looked scared to death. To be walking out there because pyro was being set off as they're trying to bring this dog out onto the stage. You got concussions, you've got pyro going off, and this dog wanted to be anywhere but on that stage. I, I felt bad for the dog. And then I saw a lot of people felt the same way. There were a lot of people who were angry at Cody for even thinking it would be a good idea to bring the dog out there. Now he's done this before. But with the pyro, I mean, I would imagine you put any animal out there dog, cat, pig. You know, whatever. <laughs> Zebra. They're probably not going to like it very much if you set off a shitload of pyro, you know, a few feet in front of them. Now, when the show was over, Tony Khan said that he did not want that to happen again. And he said that Brandy was not happy with her husband after the show was over. So he's got to answer to her as far as that goes. But that was a really stupid thing to do. And hopefully uh, we will not see Pharaoh the dog out anymore uh, in the arena you know, he's a cute dog. He is. He's a cute dog. And I know Cody's always posting photos and video of him on social media. That's great. That's great. He doesn't have to be out there in the building. Tully Blanchard was in Sean Spears' corner while Cody chose to go with MJF to be in his. Uh, they were heavily foreshadowing an MJF turn on Cody, which did not happen. But it's coming. Tully got a lot more physical in this match than I expected that he would, all things considered. I mean, you compare him to some of his, uh, his, his brethren. He's moving around pretty well for a guy in his 60s. Spears gave Cody a nasty running DVD on the floor. Cody eventually hit the crossroads, but Tully distracted Earl Hebner. MJF and Tully Blanchard got into it in the ring. Tully grabbed him. I think he grabbed him by the neck. Started choking him. Sean Spears took out MJF. Outside the ring, Tully is stomping on MJF when who should walk down to the ring 
but double A, Arn Anderson. Now, I was hoping he would be in Cody's corner and he would turn on Cody because the horsemen have always hated the Rhodes family. Why break with tradition? But this was the next best thing. I was hoping we would see Arn. We got Arn. Arn rolled into the ring. He hit his patented spine buster on Sean Spears. Still a beauty after all these years. Tully looked uh, flabbergasted. He couldn't believe what his former tag team partner had done, his former fellow horseman had done. And as Arn walked back up the ramp through the tunnel to leave, Tully, with this shocked look on his face, follows suit and just walks to the back through the other tunnel. He just leaves. <laughs> no explanation for you. Inexplicably walks to the back never to be seen again. Why would he do this? That made no sense. He left his man high and dry. Cody teased the chair shot of his own on Spears. Instead, he tossed the chair to Sean Spears, who caught it, and he hit the disaster kick, knocked the chair back into his face. Uh, somehow, this was not a disqualification. I didn't say everything in this match made sense. I just said that overall, I liked it more than most of the other matches. That doesn't mean it had, that everything made sense, because it didn't. Uh, and that was one of those parts that didn't make a whole lot of sense. He then hit the crossroads and picked up the win. Uh, when the match was over in the back, Cody made it very clear. He was doing an interview, and he said that this issue with Sean Spears, as far as he's concerned, is over. That's it. It's done. They're moving on to other opponents. Maybe Sean Spears doesn't feel the same way, and in storyline, he ends up attacking Cody, and it continues. But, boy, you know, him beating him straight up like this, this sure felt like this issue was over. That the whole point of this was just to establish Sean Spears as a heel on the roster. Put him with Tully. Hopefully Tully sticks with him for a while because I have a feeling he's going to need him. Uh, and he can move on to other opponents. But Cody beat him. Cody got his revenge for the chair shot. There's nothing left. There's no need for this to continue on after this. And that surprised me because I figured they would want to carry this on a little bit longer. But they blew it off. So really he's right. There's no reason to keep this thing going at this point. But when the match was over, MJF got into the ring. And he reached down, and he picked up a chair. He picked up the chair that was in the ring. And he started to very subtly tease that he might hit Cody with the chair. When Cody turned around, he chucked it aside. He raised Cody's arm. I thought this was a really fun match. Not everything uh, made sense, but it was a really fun match. I enjoyed the cameo by Arn Anderson. Interesting to point out, Cody was the only member of the Elite crew that won a match last night. The Bucks lost. Hangman lost, Omega lost, and Cody won. And there's reason for him to win. There's a reason for this. It's building to something. And it has to do with MJF, and I'll talk about that at the end of the review when I get there. We had the Lucha Bros, Pentagon and Phoenix. Phoenix looked pretty good for that uh, leg injury he suffered on that indie show about a week ago. They took on the Young Bucks in a ladder match for the AAA Tag Team Titles. Too many crazy things to recap here. I'll name a few. I mean, there was a running dive by Nick Jackson under the ladder and through the ropes out onto Pentagon. Pentagon hit a destroyer to Matt Jackson off a ladder through a table. They showed four replays of this, which is notable because the way you know AEW does things a lot like WCW used to, where they'll wait until the end of the match and then they'll show you highlights from the match, which I kind of I kind of like because. You don't get the constant interruptions like you do on a WWE show where they show you, if somebody picks their nose in the ring, they'll show you five replays of it from five different angles and slow-mo. It's not necessary. But this was such a crazy move. We got instant replay from four different angles, four times. They replayed this friggin' move. How Matt Jackson didn't uh, kill himself, I'll, I have no idea. How, these, how all four of these guys didn't kill themselves, I'll never know. We had... Matt setting Phoenix up for a tombstone. Now we're skipping ahead towards the end. Matt has Phoenix up for a tombstone. Nick is on the ladder. Now Nick is looking at this. He's got two choices. His brother wants him to hit, I guess a melter driver. He wants him to hit a move so they can kill Pentagon, or rather uh, kill Phoenix. But he looks up and he sees the titles. So what does he do? Do you hit the move and show off, or do you climb up and retrieve the titles? So as he took time to contemplate this great life decision, Pentagon super kicked Matt, and then he tipped the ladder over, sent Nick crashing through one of the two tables that had been set up outside the ring. Uh, his feet caught the top rope on the way down. 
And as it was, it looked like he cut his hand. His hand or his wrist was all bloody. That could have been a lot worse. That was very dangerous. I mean, he caught his feet in such a way that had he landed a little bit differently, it could have been curtains for him. So all things considered, he got off easy on that move. As Matt is fighting with Pentagon now on the ladder, he rips off Pentagon's mask to massive boos. This is what John Moxley did. I think it was at that, was it Northeast Wrestling or some independent wrestling show a few weeks ago? The last indie match that Moxley had, he insisted on wrestling Pentagon. He wanted to keep the match and not cancel it, so he really didn't take too many bumps on his uh, elbow. But I think in the in that match that the two of them had, he did the same thing, where he yanked off uh, Pentagon's mask. So here he yanks off the mask. Instant boos for Matt Jackson, because you don't do that. You don't disrespect a luchador by ripping off their mask. Pentagon immediately covers his face with his hands. Phoenix knocks the ladder over. Matt takes a nasty spill. Once Pentagon gets his mask back on, Matt Jackson was in for some pain in the form of a package pile driver through a ladder bridge on the outside. The ladder did not break. So now you have Matt dead. Nick is dying. And the Lucha Bros finally climb up and they grab the tag team titles to retain. This was a total car crash. One of those matches you can't take your eyes off of because you're going to miss five different things. But that also doesn't make it the best match on the entire show. You know, I don't think it was. People see a match like this and you know, they, they become subject to a lot of hyperbole. Oh my God, it's the greatest thing I ever saw. It's the greatest this, it's the greatest that. It's a great match, but it wasn't the best match of the night. Still a hell of a battle. After the match was over, Bill Clinton and JFK attacked the Lucha Bros. What a match that's going to be. Uh, or should I say two men in Bill Clinton and JFK masks? If JFK attacked the Lucha Bros last night, then that's a much bigger news story. <laughs> that's a much bigger news story than it is for this one podcast. So they get attacked. And when they pull the masks off, they reveal themselves as Santana and Ortiz. LAX has made their choice, and their choice is AEW. Although it'll have to be under a different name, I believe, because Impact owns the LAX name. Uh, yes, Impact does now allow its talent to take their names with them, like EC3 did, a lot of good it did him. Uh, but that, uh, he, let me say this actually, before I even go on about EC3, and the sad sack that he has become, and I feel bad for the guy. You know, EC3 came into NXT with all this fanfare, and he, he was over, he was very popular, and I remember him being part of that six-man uh, matchup that they had to crown the first ever North American champion, and things looked promising for EC3. And then he got called down to the main roster, and it has been all downhill since then. And he was doing a podcast this past week with Zack Ryder and Kurt Hawkins. They recorded it. The video is up. I, I, don't, where, I don't even know where I watched the video. It might have been their own personal YouTube channel, I guess. Wherever it was. I'm watching them. They're sitting in a room at a table talking about toys and stuff. And they show EC3 his first official WWE action figure. And the EC3 action figure, I guess, comes with a microphone in its hand. And there were a few times during this podcast where EC3 took little subtle, not so subtle pot shots at his treatment so far in WWE. So he sees the action figure with the mic in his hand and he goes, oh, look, I got a microphone in my hand. I wish I had a microphone in my hand in real life, too. You could tell this guy is just, you know, mi miserable in terms of he knows that he could be doing better and he wishes he could do more. Who knows? Maybe he likes his job enough to not raise a stink. He's got friends there. He's living the life. He came across here like a guy who on the inside is dying a little bit each day that goes by. And I feel bad for the guy. Because who knows what you know his, his limit could have been. I'm not saying he would have been the next Universal Champion. But certainly he could be doing a lot better than he is now. He could have been the MJF of WWE. That's the role that I would have envisioned for him as a heel, not as a babyface. He could have been the closest thing to an MJF-type character in WWE. And I think he could have done well for himself. If nothing else, he could have been a great intercontinental champion, U.S. champion, uh, maybe competing for a world title one day. And to see what they've done or not done with him is a just a fucking disgrace. And now you see it coming through when he does some of these interviews and you can see how much it just eats him up inside. So, anyway, uh, 
why did I even mention EC3? Now I'm trying to remember what I... Oh, right. So EC3 got to take the name with him because Impact, I think last year, had instituted this new rule, which is very cool of them to do, that allows their talent to take their gimmick, their name, their character with them, wherever they go. LAX is probably the exception to that rule because LAX does not belong to Santana and Ortiz. They inherited the LAX name from Conan and Homicide and, and uh, Hernandez many years ago, back to the TNA days. So that really is a TNA gimmick. So I don't believe they're able to use the LAX name. They'll have to come up with a new name. But they are now in AEW. And I look at this and I say, you know, with their arrival, I dare say, AEW already has, they haven't even debuted on TV yet, and they already have the best tag team division in all of wrestling at the moment. They have the Young Bucks, the Lucha Bros, LAX, Luchasaurus and Jungle Boy. And if I'm them, they, they've got to be in the running for winning that tag team title tournament. I mean, they may be the most overact in that entire company right now. You've got SCU, you've got Private Party, you've got Jack Evans and Angelico. You throw in the best friends, you throw in the Dark Order. Not that I'm a huge fan of the gimmick, but they're, you know, they're a good team. And we still don't know who Chris Jericho's partners are going to be on that first TNT show and that six-man tag. It may be a new tag team, or it could be two singles wrestlers. We don't know. But right now, they've got the tag team division to beat, as far as I'm concerned. And I'm not saying that W, I'm not shitting all over WWE. They have no good teams. They've got the Usos. They've got the Revival. Uh, even the New Day. I know a lot of people are tired of the New Day, but they're a good team. They've got some good teams in WWE. But their tag team division right now is just all over the place. I think, you know, it says it all that the fact that Seth Rollins and Braun Strowman are the current tag team champions on Monday Night Raw and are likely to be beaten by the new makeshift team of Dolph Ziggler and Bobby Roode. And you're going to sit there and try to convince me, as one guy tried to do on Twitter, that WWE has the best tag team division. Sit your ass down. We're not counting NXT teams right now. Even I think even if you did count NXT teams. I'm not taking anything away from uh, O'Reilly and Fish. But right now, AEW can lay claim to having the strongest tag team division in all of wrestling. You can debate me on that if you want to. You can fight me on that. I don't give a shit. You want to fight me on it? <laughs> I don't know if people say fight me when they when they put their opinions online. Fight me. I don't give a shit if you fight me or not. You're not going to change my mind. What do you think? You're going to change my mind? I'm making a statement. You're not going to change my mind. So... Tag team wrestling is alive and well in AEW. That's a positive thing. Everybody should be happy. If you're a fan of tag team wrestling, give AEW a shot. Because right now they have put together so far one hell of a tag team division. And then we had the main event. To crown the first ever AEW world champion Chris Jericho against Hangman Adam Page. Page rode a horse out for his entrance. Thankfully no pyro to spook the horse. But I guess uh, him riding the horse out, you know, that's part of all that cowboy shit that he's always talking about. Early in the match, Jericho countered a shooting star press by Page off the apron with the knees. So Page hits the shooting star off the apron, Jericho gets the knees up. Uh, that was in the first just few minutes of the match. Later on, Jericho locked on the walls. Page fought his way out of it. He waffled Jericho with a discus punch. Uh, Jericho retreated to the floor and opened him up above the eye. Either that or he bladed. I think he might have bladed. Either way, he got a lot of color all over his face. Finish came after Jericho hit a code breaker for a near fall. Hangman hit the dead eye, which is the reverse tombstone, also for a near fall. Buckshot Lariat followed for another near fall. And then, out of nowhere, Jericho hits the Judas Effect, which is his new reverse kind of uh, back elbow finish. Knocked out Page and pinned him 1-2-3 to become the first ever AEW champion. You gotta love it. Kicked out of Hangman's finish and then pinned him with an elbow. God bless Chris Jericho. <laughs> Kicked out of this guy's finish and just beat him clean with an elbow. Can you imagine if that was anyone else? If that was any other veteran in his spot? If, if Triple H did that to somebody? Oh my God. <laughs> and I probably would be the first one. To, uh, to chime in on the uproar, I will admit. 
But it, you know what? As far as Jericho winning, though, it was the right it was the right call. I said months ago I would have put the title on Chris Jericho here. And that's exactly what they did. And they not only did they put the title on Chris Jericho, but they put the title on him clean. No controversy, no interference, no weapons. He hit his finish, and he pinned him. And Paige's time will come, but it's too soon. It just felt too soon to put the championship on him. Jericho is a known commodity. He's a great heel. There's a lot of different people you could put up against him now. It opens up a lot of different avenues as far as potential opponents and who you transition that title to next. I thought these two had a really good match. I know the finish fell flat for a lot of people. It came out of nowhere. I, I was not expecting him to just hit the elbow and pin him one, two, three. Uh, but I thought this was a really good match. In fact, I think this was probably my... Well, let's see here. I like the Cody match, and I would say number two... You know, it's tough. I, I think I would go with this match as number two. I might go with this match as number two. But Omega and Pac, that was really good also. I might go with that number three. It's tough. It's 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 close between those two. Uh, AEW also announced their next pay-per-view titled Full Gear coming up on Saturday, November 9th from the Royal Farms Arena in Baltimore, Maryland, the same building that WWE runs tomorrow night for Monday Night Raw. And I look at that Full Gear show, and I, I was thinking, okay, what, what are the top matches going to be for this show? Obviously, nothing has been officially announced yet. I, I see it the way that I'm guessing a lot of you probably see it, as far as what the top three matches are going to be on that show. I look at it as Pac against Hangman Page. That was the match that was supposed to happen back at Double or Nothing, and Pac couldn't show, didn't show, whatever. Uh, not only that, but Pac threw a water bottle, apparently. He chucked a water bottle at Hangman's head backstage after the show last night. So that seems like that's the next match. Omega and Moxley, if we assume by November Moxley is going to be good to go, that's the match we should have had last night. They can do it at the next pay-per-view. And the main event for the championship, it would seem to me, and this goes to what I was saying earlier when I was talking about Cody and MJF, Cody keeps winning. And Cody was the only member of the Elite to win last night. Got a big win. And now Chris Jericho is the champion. It would seem that they're setting up for Chris Jericho defending the title. Probably at this show. Against Cody. And that, I would expect, is the place where MJF finally turns on Cody. It's a very weird dynamic having MJF, who is a tremendous heel. He's just, he's so good at what he does. I, I love just everything about the guy. He barely ever breaks character, and he just goes out of his way to make people hate his guts, like a classic heel would. He can talk. He He's great. But this friendship that he has with Cody, who's supposed to be a babyface and comes out and gets a babyface reaction, but he picks MJF to be in his corner, it's very strange. And I have to think that it's all leading somewhere. They They certainly were teasing it a lot last night. I think it leads to Cody getting a championship match, and Cody is going to lose, but he's going to finally lose because MJF fucks him out of the title. And Jericho retains. So that's how I see things turning at this next pay-per-view. That, that's how I see the top of the card for this uh, Full Gear show. I'm not sure where they got that name from, Full Gear. That's a very strange name for a pay-per-view. It's more like a description for uh, like a wrestler. If you're going to send the guy out, go, go change into Full Gear. <laughs> it's... I don't know. Just a strange name. The name is not important. Uh, hopefully they'll be able to put together a card that, on paper, looks good and gets people to pop down 50 bucks because that's what I had to do last night. You know, you, you kind of forget that you, you watch Fighter Fest and you watch Fight for the Fallen, which I did on the uh, BR Live app or website, and those shows were free. You know, I mean, I paid to go to Double or Nothing. I made a whole Vegas weekend out of it. But the next two shows I watched and didn't have to pay anything because they were free. And now it's like, oh, I got to pay 50 bucks. It's been a long time that I paid for a pay-per-view. You get so used to the WWE Network if you're a subscriber. And all of these shows that WWE does, there's so many of them now. You don't really, I mean, you're paying for it, but you're not really paying for it. It's not like the old days where you'd have to call the cable company or whip out the credit card 50 bucks or 34.95 or whatever it would be. And I realize like I'm watching this and I'm like, "Huh. You know, I've had subscriptions to New Japan World and the WWE Network and you get so accustomed to that. 
I had to stop myself for a second and say, am I really doing this? <laughs> am I spending 50 bucks on this show? And I did. And I, I thought I got my money's worth. When it was over, it was very long, but I was entertained. And on the whole, I thought that this show delivered. And based on the poll results so far, 83 to 17, I mean, uh, clearly I'm not alone in that opinion. So I thought it was a, a good effort last night. And I am looking forward to the October 2nd launch. That's going to be a, a pivotal day in wrestling history. It's going to be the start of something either that we're going to look back on a year from now and say, oh, what might have been? What a, what a flop that was. Or we're going to look back and say that was the day that people, you know, were able to finally, you know, tune into a real alternative. And we have a real number two now in this country as far as pro wrestling is concerned. It's going to be a while before we find out the answer to that question, but, you know, everybody, every wrestling fan, whether you are going to watch AEW or not, should be hoping for the best. I at least hope that they do well enough to, you know, be a, a healthy, viable alternative for anybody who doesn't like what they're seeing on Monday nights. And they can tune in on Wednesdays and they can see a different kind of product and it can flourish and do well. And maybe we can get back to a point where guys don't feel as though they have to just go to WWE. They can go to an AEW and if they get television time and if they get built up and after a few years they don't want to be in AEW anymore and they have aspirations to go somewhere else you can have a bidding war between the two companies you could have people jumping ship from one company to the other i mean WWE doesn't really let people go anymore but as contracts come due and stuff you know the next thing is the revival it's the revival you know are they going to re-sign with WWE or are they going to leave are they going to be can you add their name to the tag team division in AEW you don't think they'd love to get in there with some of those teams I rattled off earlier and mix it up with them? Instead of wrestling the same faces every single week? But there's a long way to go before their contracts are over next year. So who's to say if they're going to stay, are they going to go? And there could be names far bigger than Dash and Dawson whose contracts come due, and it can make for some very interesting uh, backstage news and notes when it comes to uh, contracts and people jumping ship and all that kind of stuff that we really haven't seen for a very long time. So that's why when I say you don't have to watch AEW if you don't want to, you know, not everybody has to be an AEW fan, but everybody should be rooting for success because their success is going to rub off on a whole bunch of other people. So it's exciting. It's exciting to see that we could be close to something like that again.